of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Friends, before we continue calling us one another to worship, please be reminded that we are filming today and we're doing so respectfully to the glory of God to help tell the story of faith here at the Kirk. And also following the call to worship, we will be singing verses one through four only, not five of all creatures of our God and King. Friends, our help is in the name of the Lord, who created heaven and earth. Sing out with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. For the Lord is full of grace and everlasting love. God's faithful, loving kindness endures for all generations.
friends, trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess the ways we don't get it right, that we have let one another down and have sinned against God and our community. Let us pray together. Merciful God, we confessed we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive what we have been. Help us to change what we are and direct what we shall be through the love of Jesus Christ. the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Live in God's love and share the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. You may be seated. I want to welcome you on this wonderful Sunday morning, that cool autumn morning air here in Michigan, and welcome you to worship as one family in Christ. It is so good to be with you. Whether you're a first-time visitor or have been with us regularly, you are welcome in this place. And if you're joining us online via Facebook, our live stream, or our friends at Kirk West at the Fox Run campus, we are so thankful that the Spirit has drawn us together to worship the one living God. Friends, I want to draw your attention right now to the friendship pads located in your pews. If someone would just raise those up in the air. Could someone raise those so you know what they look like? Yep, that's what they look like. We would love if you would let us know that you were in worship today. We'd love to uh, get to know you following the service. If you could share your information with us, especially your email, we'd love to connect you to all that is happening here at the Kirk and the ways that we believe God is blessing us and blessing the world through the work here. So we'd love to get that information and of course make note of the name there written on the pew pad so you can greet one another following worship. Uh, of course, we want to offer, again, as I mentioned, a special welcome uh, to Keith Famey and his team, uh, as well as the PBS team, all of them, for uh, being a part of worship this morning and helping tell the Kirk story. So we're so grateful for that. A uh, couple of other announcements. We have our new member classes coming up in November. If you are looking for a church home or know someone who is, please let them know to come to Cedar Home Chapel following the nine o'clock service. And that'll be for the next uh, two, the first two Sundays in November. And then they will be received uh, on that third Sunday. We're also grateful to announce uh, that Accent Pontiac, the Kirk's very own nonprofit, uh, we will host them for their sixth annual Green 
Bucket Run right here on the Kirk campus. If you haven't signed up and you're a runner, you really need to. And if you haven't signed up and you're not a runner, it's okay. You can always begin again. And if you haven't signed up and don't plan on ever running, you can join me walking, right? That's, you can just join me and we'll walk in the spirit by faith, right? Uh, so friends, we're so excited about that. And of course, uh, in your at the Kirk insert, there's so much information there about upcoming programming uh, like Dinner Church, the Veterans Luncheon, uh, and so much more. So I hope you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, make, uh, you'll avail yourself of that resource. And lastly, of course, this morning, we have the wonderful privilege and honor of welcoming some new families to the faith. We have five families this morning, uh, and we will be baptizing uh, five children. So we are so excited about that. So friends, uh, no further ado, we will present the families. If the families would please come stand before the congregation, and Elder Nancy Lau will do the introductions. I would remind you that in the Presbyterian tradition, we have two sacraments. This is the sacrament that uh, is the entryway into the faith. Uh, so we welcome these new brothers and sisters in Christ today. Nancy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This morning, we have the joy of celebrating with Megan Bursky, Colby and Caitlin Hahn, James and Lauren Pearlberg, Joshua and Kristen Peruzzi, and Oliver and Kylan Stahl, who are bringing forward their children for baptism. On behalf of Session, I present Bison Bursky, Enno Hahn, Cameron Pearlberg, Decker Peruzzi, and Brooklyn Stahl for baptism. Friends, if you would turn and face the baptismal font. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Obeying the Lord Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death and unites us to Christ Jesus in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and join to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. And so for you parents, uh, you are presenting your children here today. We want you to know that our whole church receives your children with joy. In presenting your child for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ and show that you want your child to, stu to study Christ, to know Christ, to love and to serve Christ in God's grace. So this question is for you as parents. Do you intend your child to be Christ's disciple, to obey his word and to show his love? If so, please say, we do. Kirk family, will you now receive these children into the Church of Christ? And will you surround them and their parents with your love, your care, and your prayers so that their family and their faith will be strengthened and in time they may confess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? If so, please say, we will. We will. Will the congregation please stand as we say the Apostles' Creed together and profess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, would you join me in prayer? Creator God, in the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters and called forth order and life. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil by the waters of the flood and gave righteousness a new beginning. Through the waters, you led Israel out of slavery into the promised land. In Jesus' own baptism, you anointed him as your beloved son. In the baptism of his death and resurrection, Christ sets us free from sin and death and opens to us the way to eternal life. We ask that you send your spirit to move over this water that it may continually be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Wash away the sin of all who are cleansed by it and raise them to new life as part of the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit on the baptized that they may have the power to do your will and to continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ. In the name of the God who is our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. And friends, if you would please step forward. Cameron and Megan, if you would come first. Friends, <clears throat> If you would state your child's full Christian name. Mason Michael Bursky. Bison Michael Bursky. Bursky, I'm sorry. <laughs> Michael Bison Bursky, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Gracious God, uphold this child by your spirit. Give him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, of knowledge and awe of the Lord, the spirit of the joy in your presence now and forever. Amen. Thank you. Colby and Caitlin. Would you state your child's full Christian name for the church? I know James Hahn. And O James Han, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Lord, uphold this child by your Spirit. Give him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, of the knowledge and awe of the Lord, the spirit of the joy of your presence now and forever. Amen. James and Lauren. And would you state your child's full Christian name for the church? Cameron Kelly Pearlberg. Cameron Kelly Pearlberg, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Gracious God, uphold this child by your spirit Give this child the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, of knowledge and love of the Lord, now and always. And give him, her, the child of your joy and presence eternally. Thank you. God bless you. Joshua and Kristen. As you present your child, would you state for the church your child's full Christian name? Decker Gerald Michael Perusi. Jack Decker Gerald Michael Perusi, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we ask that you uphold this child by your spirit. Give this child the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, of knowledge and awe of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence now and eternally. Amen. Yeah, God bless you. And Oliver and Kaylin. As you present your child for baptism, would you Share with the church your child's full Christian name. Brooklyn Emery Stahl. 
Brooklyn Emory Stall, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Gracious God, uphold this child by your Spirit. Give this child the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, of knowledge and awe before the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, now and eternally. Amen. God bless you. Friends, I'm going to invite the families to uh, come with me down the center aisle here uh, as we want to uh, introduce you to your new brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, you have made promises to these children. In so doing, remember that God has made promises to us all. See what love the Father has given that we could be called children of God, for that is what we are, and that is what these children are. Remember the promises that you have made to support these children. Remember the promises that you have made to all the children of the church. And let us join together and uh, share in that joy and celebration. Would you please begin in our baptismal hymn uh, as we share this together. Friends, God bless you all, and uh, there is a gift that each of you has, a gift from the congregation. We pray for your children and for you now and always. Amen. Friends, at this time, I would like to invite forward Ryan True, an elder who will be sharing a stewardship message. Uh, but 
Before he begins, just a couple of more things to share this morning. Following this service, there is a new member brunch uh, to which all of our church leaders are invited. That's in the St. Andrew's room. And if you have joined this church within the last three years, you are invited. We'd love to see you for our new member brunch in St. Andrews. And also following today's service, we of course have Stephen ministers available for private and confidential prayer in Melrose Chapel, as well as our deacons flower ministry. So we hope that you'll take one and be a blessing to one another. And finally, we give thanks to God uh, for the birth of a healthy baby boy. Uh, to the Ford family, Calvin, Sarah, Eli, and Nell welcomed uh, Walker Maffin on October 18th. Mom and baby are both healthy. And also congratulations to Ken and Melanie Guardhouse, who welcomed a baby girl on October 14th. May God continue to bless this wonderful congregation. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Edwin. Hi. I, I, I promised I, no dad jokes this morning. Uh, if I had known there were this many kids, I might have prepared one. But instead, you know, I wanted to share a different type of story with you. A story about a person who's taken God's love for granted. A person who's taken the church for granted for many, way too many years. As a kid, it's kind of easy to, you know, just show up at church and, you know, see the majesty. The, it's like a castle in here. Look forward to, you know, coffee hour, hopefully getting some good snacks, you know. As a kid, you got to have priorities. But, you know, maybe, you know, as you're going older and, you know, you, you know, start doing Sunday school or, you know, start doing other stuff, you know, church maybe takes a little bit of a back stop. You know, you're a college student now, you're coming back. That person, you know, is showing up only for Christmas and Easter. You know, the pageantry, the beauty, the majesty of the church, you know, it's... You know, it's really easy to assume that it's always like that. Every day, every Sunday when you're not here, it's always that same majesty at Christmas or at Easter. You know, even when you come back and you're actually back home for good and, you know, you're a young adult, you know, busy with your young adult life, it's, you show up, you know, you're, you know, going to church because your mom wants you to be there with you or because, you know, it's a good place to, you know, maybe establish a life. but. You volunteer here or there, but you don't understand what the real blessings are that come from this church. Maybe it's, you know, not to you have your own family until you're there with, with your own child, getting them baptized, or you're here getting married, and you start a little bit of the inkling of how much of a blessing the Kirk in the Hills can be. It's really not until you really start getting involved and you realize, oh, I want to make sure, you know, your family, I want to make sure my family has that opportunity, those blessings that I've had. And, and you know, the reality finally starts to seep in about how special God's love is in this magnificent building. How wonderful and how much it takes for God's love to be here. It's more than just us showing up on a Sunday morning, hearing wonderful sermons, hearing how beautiful the choir is every Sunday. Instead, it's, it's, it's more than that. It's about the people who are here on a Tuesday night making sure decisions are made so that we can have an orderly process, as Dr. McDonald likes to remind us. It's, it's people showing up for homecoming, you know, hours early, the meetings to plan the events. It took me volunteering and getting involved step by step to realize how much of a blessing it is to have this church and how much more it takes for this church to be really than just some place that's just wonderful for people to be at. You know, these gifts that we give, not only, you know, the, the gift of time, but the gift of money, the gift of love, you know, that, that's what it takes to keep this church to be so wonderful as it is. As Mr. Rogers, who's a personal hero of mine, once said, the real issue in life is not how many blessings we have, but what we do with our blessings. Some people have many blessings and hoard them. Some have few and give everything away. I would ask this congregation to not take the blessings of God's love in the Kirk in the Hills for granted, but to share their blessings, their, their time, their treasure, but most importantly, their love with 
this beautiful, wonderful place. So that way God's love can continue for years to come. As our little kids are baptized, grow up through Sunday school, they can feel God's love and they can repeat the cycle with us. So thank you and God bless. In this stewardship season, we have the amazing opportunity to respond to God's love, not just with our time and talent, but with our treasure, our pledges, our offerings, our tithes, things that we give out of the many blessings we have received. So as we pray, we pray that God would open up our hearts and that we would be cheerful givers. Let us pray. God, we are so thankful for your mercies are new every morning. We're thankful for the many gifts you have bestowed upon us and the gifts we have experienced even here, Lord. The wonderful baptisms, the celebrations of new life being born into our congregation and all that you are calling us to do and all the people you are calling us to serve and to love. We pray that the resources we share today, our pledges, our offerings, our tithes may be used for the building up of the church may be used to the glory of your name and the healing of the world you love so much. Make us cheerful givers, giving generously and sacrificially in Christ's name. Amen.
Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Gracious God, send your Holy Spirit to move among us that through your words of Scripture and your living word, Jesus, we might be surprised to find his presence speaking to us anew. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're in a long series looking at love. We come today to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Listen for the word of the Lord. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone into the world. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love, abide in God, and God abides in them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The day I was ordained, I had invited the associate executive presbyter uh, to uh, preach the sermon, Phil Brown. And Phil said to me that he was not much of a preacher and I should ask someone else. But I insisted, and he agreed, and he preached, and I discovered that he was pretty self-aware. <laughs> I don't remember a thing he said, but I still have the book that he gave me, a book whose first sentence I have never forgotten and think of often. It is The Road Less Traveled by Scott Peck, and the first line is, Life is difficult. Most brilliant line, most brilliant opening sentence in any book. Life is difficult. He goes on to say, once we know that life is difficult, once we truly understand and accept it, then life is no longer difficult. Life is a series of problems, and we can either moan about them or we can solve them. And we can teach our children to solve them. Discipline is the tools that it takes to solve life's problems. It's a profound book. It's still, still something that challenges me and, and evokes important thoughts for me. Because love is difficult. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. We've looked at a number of other passages, but today I want to talk more directly about just how difficult love is and that love implies limits. Calvin Miller tells the story of how he, as a young man with his friends, uh, had been afraid of a strange old man in the neighborhood. And the more these young boys talked about how strange he was, the more they decided they needed to do something to express themselves, and they decided it would be a good idea to set fire to the weeds in this strange old man's backyard. But instead of burning just a little nuisance fire, it spread and spread into the yard and beyond. It threatened the neighborhood. It would have burned down the old man's house if the fire department had not arrived in time to stop it. Miller ran home and told his mother what happened. And he asked her, Mother, do you think I will have to go to jail? And his mother replied, Son, I certainly hope so. <laughs> she loved him. But love has limits. Sometimes when we talk about love as Christians, we end up thinking in some pretty fuzzy ways. We want to talk about love as agape in the New Testament, but we have to admit, sometimes our agape is pretty sloppy. It is a hardcore Christian virtue, love, and something we need to not just talk about, but to think about clearly. Will Willimon, uh, who teaches at Duke University, writes that Christian ethics has been reduced to good intentions. 
Uh, he, he names the classic cartoon of Charles Schultz, uh, the artist who drew the comic strip Peanuts. You remember Peanuts, uh, Linus is always talking about the great pumpkin coming on Halloween. When he first says that, Charlie Brown looks at him and says, you're crazy. And Linus answers, well, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Well, that's kind of the way that people think in fuzzy ways. We want to accept everyone, but sometimes there are things that are unacceptable and we need to test the spirits, as the scripture says, to offer up critique to the ways that we and others think in the world. Rabbi Edwin Friedman has a book, Friedman's Fables, Rabbi Friedman tells one story in particular I'd like to share with you in an abridged format. It's a story of a family who have a baby, but as the child grows, they come to realize that the child's ganglia, its feelings, are growing not on the inside like they should be, but on the outside of its skin. And the more he grows, the more the feelings keep growing and they're cascading down him like a, like a hairy sort of creature. These feelings that go all the way down to the floor and then begin to cascade out and beyond as he grows older. More and more, they live life around his feelings, careful not to bump into him, careful not to step on his feelings, not to hurt his feelings, because every time they do, he shrieks and says, watch out, don't hurt my feelings. This goes on day after day until finally, after years, his mother has had all she can take, and she reaches out and stomps on his feelings. He screeches, you've hurt my feelings, which leads her to stomp again. The father sees what's going on and he rushes over and he joins in stomping on his feelings. And pretty soon the young man runs into his room and locks the door and stays there until the next day when he comes out and all of his feelings have gone back inside his skin where they belong. Rabbi Edmund Friedman, someone who shares a story about recognizing the limits that love needs to take. We can end up being tyrannized by people's feelings. If we think that love means we never have to hurt anybody's feelings, then we'll never say anything important and we'll never truly help them grow. And in fact, we may be destructive of ourselves and our families. We need to recognize when love needs limits. For the good of ourselves, for the good of our families, for the good of society. Suffice it to say, we do not live in a value-free culture or a value-neutral universe. Rather, we dwell in this place that is difficult and challenging. And we need to think things through carefully. Pastoral theologians like Don Browning of Princeton show that a lot of people's psychological discomfort is really not about having bad feelings, it's about moral confusion. And they need to think things through morally, to think things through carefully. They need, perhaps, to have their lives reordered. Or maybe, in Christ, they need a new creation, a new order, a new beginning. For love to be real, it has to be based in truth. Love means people need to think clearly, to test the spirits, as John says, to ask questions, to seek motivations, to look discerningly at what's going on in our lives in the world. Take a look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. And there's a lot of people who want to stop the sermon right there and says, see, we should not be judgmental. But that isn't all of what Jesus says. Jesus goes on to say, before you take the speck out of your brother's eye, take the log out of your own. Notice what he did there. He flipped the metaphor. Instead of being judges who are seeking to justify and condemn others, justify themselves and condemn others, he turns them from judges into healers. 
The point of any judgment that we might have is the question, is this really looking to heal, to give life, to give vitality, to give a sense of shalom in someone's life? The intention is to think clearly about love, to heal people. And sometimes that means taking the log out of our own eye before we can heal someone else. I have a friend who's a surgeon. He talks about his internship. On his rounds in the first day in the hospital in Dallas, this rough old doctor looked at him and says, what's the first thing you do in an emergency? And before the intern could answer, the old doctor barked, take your own darn pulse. (laughs) The first thing that we need to do is to take a look at ourselves, to test the selves, ourselves, to test our spirits, our motivations, habits, values, goals, hidden agendas, prejudices, to take a look at ourselves as we relate to the culture around us. The Gospel of John and the school that wrote in John's name set up a dualism of thinking about the church versus the world. Um, that's a metaphor. That's, that's not an ontological statement. That's a metaphor to motivate people to get them moving. But it's not an absolute division because Jesus very much was involved in the world. And so we need to bring our critical, loving thinking to our personal lives, and, 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 and to the world around us. There may be, as one might say, clothes in our ethical closet that do not fit us. Some things that we need to look at and be critical of ourselves about. What's in your closet? We are tempted by racism and sexism and homophobia. We are tempted to ignore family struggles and we are tempted to not talk about what leads to war in the world. And when we do, there may be people who scream out, don't talk about those things, you may hurt my feelings. But we have to talk about those things because they're real. And love compels us to take a look at ourselves and our culture and the world around us and to test the spirits, to see what is love creating and what is shalom making. When 1 John talks about love, there's a sense of growing in love. It talks about perfecting love, but but it never with the intention that you're ever going to completely be perfected. Because if we expect ourselves to be perfect, then as Freud showed long ago, uh, we are liable to project our imperfections onto somebody else and turn them into scapegoats. No, the only perfection is God's love. God's love that inspires us and heals us and gives us hope and leads us forward on a journey, a journey that is lifelong. We keep growing in love. We keep trying, but we're not perfect. We just know when we fail, God's love does not give up on us. Jesus' message of grace keeps on working with us and loving us anyway. Jesus' love took a multitude of forms. He does not say that he healed everyone. When he goes out into the villages, often it says he healed many, not all. Some wouldn't listen to him. He tells his disciples, when you go out into a town, tell them the good news. And if they listen, wonderful. And if they don't, then just dust the shoes off of your feet and go on to the next town which is to say, have limits in your love. He didn't tell them to try again and again and again forever because love has to have limits. Moving on is one way that we show love in our lives. St. Augustine put it this way, if you bend over to lift someone up out of a ditch, uh, that's wonderful, that's a form of love. But if you bend over to help someone out of a ditch and you fall in yourself, what good is that? St. Augustine knew love is the greatest good, but it has to have limits. Sometimes the most loving thing we can do is brush the dust off our sandals and move on down the road. So I want to talk about marriage. We're doing this whole long series on love and I haven't talked about marriage yet. We need to recognize and celebrate marriage for what it is. 
It is one of the greatest goods in human existence. When two people love each other, nurture each other, stand by each other, laugh and cry and fight and forgive and care for a family, and they do this for decades and decades and decades, they grow old together, it is so powerfully moving. When you hear someone who's been married 40 or 50 or 60 years or more, they embody our ideal. These people are our guiding light. I like to think of marriages like that as people who have climbed Mount Everest. These two have reached the top and it is this great achievement. But we also have to recognize that some people, when they're climbing up Mount Everest, only make it halfway up to the summit. And then they come to realize if they go on, they're going to fall down some icy crevice from which they will never escape. Sometimes the best things that they can do is to quit. Jesus talks about marriage. He says, two become one flesh, but he doesn't stop there. Two become one flesh, but if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off because it's better to have your hand cut off than, than, than to go through a living hell, right? What's he talking about there? Well, I think one of the things he's talking about is divorce. Sometimes the most healthy thing you can do is to divorce because in some relationships a gangrene sets in and an amputation is the only loving, life-giving answer. Not the perfect thing, not the desired thing, but the most loving possibility in that situation. Because love has limits. The purpose of Jesus' love is to heal us, to give us shalom, to give us a, a peace in our lives. And it's not easy. It's difficult. Our answers to life's questions aren't easy, but, but we, as we think about them, we can grow into seeing new and other possibilities. And sometimes painfully we have to admit when love has limits that we need to recognize. But we always remember that God's love for us shows that God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. The intention of 1 John is to inspire us to grow into love, not to expect perfection. Love is not about being perfect people. It is about imperfect people who are inspired by God's love, which leads them on their life's journey to grow and transform and transcend and fail and fail again and find in our failures that God has caught us and is lifting us up once again and again. And then we understand in a new way what the resurrection means. We understand anew the height and breadth and depth of God's love for us all. And we understand anew that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Amen.
Please be seated. Let us join our hearts and minds together in prayer. Gracious and holy God, you are with us through the whole of life's journey. We ask your blessing this day on the baptized children, Bison, Nino, Cameron, Decker, and Brooklyn. Surround them with your love. Surround them with our love. Inspire us to be the kind of people who reach out and care in ways that are helpful and appropriate and inspiring and, and in ways that help them to envision the possibilities of love that you give to us. We pray for this congregation, its many ministries and missions. There is so much of which we have been blessed and so much that you call us to bless others. We pray for the future of this congregation. We pay for the, pray for the pastoral nominating committee as they do their work. Help them be discerning and wise to know the limits and the possibilities and the, the ways that you are calling this congregation to move into a new future surrounded by your love. We ask your blessing on this congregation as we seek to be faithful together. We pray that your grace may guide us and lead us into that future in Christ's love. And we pray together as Jesus teaches his disciples when they gather, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's my favorite hymn. That last verse, a new creation comes to life and grows as Christ's new body takes on flesh and blood. The universe restored and whole will sing. Hallelujah. May we live into that new creation. May the love of God, 
the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the hope of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. Amen.